So if we bring this back to the listener and we pretend that we're at dinner with whoever is hearing this right now and I'm hearing everything that you just said then and I'm I'm sort of left thinking, well, I just want to know, should I eat more fish? Should I supplement? And if I'm going to supplement, how much should I take? And at least my my brain here initially really zooms in on omega-3 status, which you said a few times there. And first point of call, if someone has access to it, going out and measuring omega-3 status and then using that as a way of at least understanding their baseline level and then thinking about, we've spoken about a number of things. You said you think increasing EPA and DHA is probably the smartest move. There could be also some benefits up for grabs for lowering omega-6s if someone can't get a direct source of EPA, um, DHA. But And I have this test in front of me and I've never done it and this is not a plug. I have no affiliation with this company. I won't even mention the name. But I'm going to measure my omega-3 index. Is this going to give me an accurate sort of reflection of the DHA and EPA that's in my cells? And what do I do with this information when I get it back? What is uh, less than optimal reading and where do I want to to get that to such that it would be considered or deemed to be optimal? Yeah, yeah, good question. I think you're right. So um, I've mentioned several times that um, the importance of omega-3 status, and by that I'm really meaning the amount of EPA and DHA in in blood or in blood cells or even in tissues, but, you know, we don't measure that routinely. So that is a reflection of EPA and DHA intake. So we can get a feel on whether our intake is is adequate or not um, by having our omega-3s measured in, in blood. And you mentioned you'd had Bill Harris on, and Bill is one of the people who started um, – uh, sort of validated marker of status, which, you know, he called omega-3 index, which is EPA plus DHA in red blood cells. And, you know, there are particular cutoffs. So below four and a half is, is bad and above eight and a half is what we should really be going for. Um, and, you know, Bill has done, Bill and others has done a lot of work relating that marker of status to cardiometabolic outputs and outcomes and biomarker outcomes. So it's pretty clear what that relationship is. So I think people could have their blood omega-3 status measured. And, you know, if that's done by a reputable organization, they will give you a feel for where you are, maybe according to a traffic light system or something like that. And, you know, you can test improving that through, you know, eating more fish or decreasing the oleic acid intake or taking omega-3 supplements and see whether you've moved yourself up in the status marker. And by by um, extension, if you did that, you would be lowering your risk of cardiometabolic disease. So I think, you know, for me, the primary ways of doing that, um, putting aside our discussion about sustainability and so on, would be increasing more, uh, increasing intake of, of oily fish, for example. Um, so things like, you know, salmon, mackerel, sardines, um, maybe using omega-3 supplements, maybe trying, looking for sources of alpha linolenic acid and trying to decrease the linolenic acid rich oils at the same time. So those are strategies people could take and they could monitor that through the sort of testing kit that you were talking about, Simon. Right. So just to to kind of um, emphasize that last point you were talking there will mostly be achieved through eating less ultra-processed foods that contain these omega-6-rich seed oils um, or cooking with less of these omega-6-rich seed oils and instead using canola or olive or avocado, which we spoke about before. Um, if someone is going to uh, consume fatty fish or take a supplement, what amount of fish would provide the sort of optimal amount of DHA 
and EPA. What does that look like? And then maybe we can think about a supplement as well. Yeah. So I think, um, I mean, at a minimum, people should be eating fatty fish once a week. Um, my own view is we should really be doing that maybe two or three times a week regularly. And, you know, you can mix up the fish you're using. So you could have salmon once, you could have sardines once, you could have something else like mackerel once. These are all really tasty, tasty fish. Um, and, of course, you're using those in place of um, maybe sources of, of arachidonic acid, so meat. Um, so I think that's the sort of fish intake I would be talking about. And, and that will be giving you, um, you know, close to um, probably a gram of EPA and DHA a day. We haven't really spoken specifically about a dose yet, but um, so you can, you can achieve that through, through diet for sure. So one gram of EPA and DHA a day, a day and that's, that's the uh, fish route for those that are eating seafood. A- Ansel Keys would be smiling right now because it sounds like you're describing the Mediterranean diet a little bit here. If 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 folks are not eating seafood uh, for ethical or environmental reasons and or taste, and they would rather um, take a supplement. Again, is the is the target that one gram a day of DHA and EPA? And when you're looking at that supplement on shelf, do you need to consider the amount of EPA and DHA because that often differs between brands? Yeah. So so you know I've come to one gram a day, and that that is you know that's my if you like my unofficial <laughs> recommendation. Um, but you know that's the sort of number that you know, I would normally be, be thinking of. Um, it's higher than, you know, most recommendations that are out there from governmental bodies, but I think, you know, they're a bit modest. So if that's the sort of intake I'm recommending from fish, then obviously I need to be recommending that from a supplement if that's what people are choosing to do. Um, so you have to look at the EPA and DHA content of any supplement that you might be choosing. I think, you know, you're helped if you um, look for a concentrate. Uh, So is it 45% EPA and DHA? Is it 60% EPA and DHA? Something like that. Um, Because most standard fish oils, particularly, you know, cheaper, less expensive uh, ones you might see, you know, maybe they only contain 30% EPA and DHA. So 70% of what's in the capsule is not omega-3s, and you're not interested in that. So I would look for concentrates um, and make sure, you know, you might have to take a couple of supplements a day to get up to my level of, of one gram. But I would I would really focus on EPA and DHA content of a supplement if that's the route people are going down. This episode is proudly brought to you by Inside Tracker. Track your blood biomarkers, understand your biological age, and receive personalized lifestyle tips backed by evidence to optimize your health. To get started with Inside Tracker today and get 20% off your first purchase, head to insidetracker.com forward slash Simon. That's insidetracker.com forward slash Simon for 20% off. Let's say someone's eating regularly eating fatty fish or they're doing the DHA EPA supplementation protocol that you've just outlined, but they have very little uh, ALA in their diet. Is is ALA inherently important and does it have any sort of biological functions that, um, that require us to consume it even within the context of someone who is getting enough direct source of DHA and EPA and therefore doesn't need to worry about ALA converting to those longer chain omega-3s? Yeah, that is a really good question, Simon. So so I think, so it's been really hard to ascribe biological actions to alpha linolenic acid. And most people consider that its role is to support this conversion that I talked about right at the beginning of of the show. So its role is actually acting as a precursor of EPA and DHA. Having said that, 
there are chemical mediators that are produced from alpha linolenic acid that seem to have biological action, um, just like there are chemical mediators produced from EPA and DHA that have biological action. So it might be that some actions of alpha linolenic acid emerge, but right now its main functionality is as a as a as a um well, maybe it has two functionalities. One is as a precursor to EPA and DHA, but also attempting to limit linoleic acid conversion um, in the same way that I mentioned linoleic acid limited alpha linoleic acid conversion. Um, but I think, you know, the statement that people who are consuming a high level of EPA and DHA, either through fish or through supplements, have a lower need for alpha linoleic acid, I would support that that statement for sure um but we mustn't forget you know that omega-6s limit the action of omega-3s so as well as these strategies we want to look at sources of linoleic acid as well so we're in the supplement store and we're, lo we're looking for an epa dha supplement i think if i recall correctly in my conversation with Bill, we spoke about different forms of these fatty acids. So there's the trigly triglyceride phospholipid form, which is how these would come in food in fatty fish. And then there's an ethyl ester form. Do you have a view on what form would be better absorbed or more effective or what someone should look out for on the bottle? Yeah. So... Um... As far as I'm aware, most supplements will be either the triglyceride or phospholipid form. Um, it is possible that there are supplements of ethyl esters. Now, um, all of these forms have to be digested, okay, to make the fatty acids available to us. <clears throat> and it's really important, and I don't know if Bill mentioned this, but it's really important that people take their supplements at the same time as they have a meal because because the when you eat a meal you induce all the digestive actions and there's pretty good evidence that if people take supplements and that includes ethyl esters and triglycerides um without a meal you limit the availability so whatever supplement people are using they should take it either with or around the time of a meal um there is some evidence that ethyl esters are less well absorbed than triglycerides and phospholipids. Some people say the phospholipids are the best absorbed. I think in healthy people taking supplements with a meal, it's not going to make a lot of difference, the chemical form. And ultimately, if you do measure your omega-3 status, which is why I, I think it's a good idea to do, and I think the test that I got was about $40. So it's a cost, but it's not incredibly inaccessible to many people is that you can go away implement whatever protocol it is whether it's eating fatty fish or a supplement a new supplement and then retest and to my understanding you would want to wait sort of three to four months before you you retest that's right yeah i would agree completely so i think i sort of made this point before that people could have a test um decide on a strategy adopt that strategy and they could retest and i think you're dead right i would wait three or four months um making sure i adhere to whatever my strategy is and then and then retest and that three or four months is, is all about the timing that it takes for omega-3s to go up in particularly in red blood cells which is a good marker of tissue levels mm -hmm.